Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this CAMCA conversation, which is organized by the Central Asia Caucasus Institute, the Rumsfeld Foundation, and the CAMCA Network. Uh, in the CAMCA conversations, we provide a, a platform for members of the CAMCA Network to uh, speak to uh, important issues in the CAMCA region. Uh, today, we have the uh, pleasure of welcoming four of our members of the network from Mongolia who will speak uh, on the issue of the Mongolian economy uh, and post-pandemic strategy. And there I say not only perhaps a post-pandemic strategy, but uh, I suspect we will also talk about the fallout of the current war uh, in Ukraine. Uh, because, of course, while the uh, Western media attention is almost entirely focused on, on Ukraine, uh, it doesn't mean that there is nothing happen happening in the Caucasus, Central Asia, or Mongolia, or Afghanistan, which are the uh, component uh, entities in the Kemka region. Uh, especially, of course, uh, we have seen and we're seeing uh, an economic fallout of the sanctions on Russia uh, and the general worsening of the situation on currencies, uh, on um, commodity prices, some of which may benefit some other countries in the region and some of which may be very detrimental. Uh, and it seems that there is very little uh, coverage in Western media of what is going on in Mongolia, how Mongolia is affected by the situation. And this is a perfect opportunity to address that issue and to remedy that lacuna. Uh, Mongolia, of course, uh, is heavily reliant on trade with China and has faced continuous challenges throughout the pandemic to, to maintain uh, the steady functioning of its economy. Uh, China's ongoing closure of its border, as well as budget constraints, have had a negative effect on the Mongolian economy. And as a response to these challenges, the government has proposed an economic new revival policy, which is aiming to not only solve the immediate challenges, but to address uh, the fundamental economic obstacles. Uh, we have uh, four speakers um, who will speak uh, on various aspects on this. We have Tuvshin Zaya Gantulga, uh, who is a visiting fellow at the National Institute of Strategic Studies be followed by Dulgun Basandava, who is an advisor at the Ministry of Econ Economy and Development of Mongolia. Third, we will have Irmun Demberel, who is an advisor at the Prime Minister's Office. Uh, and last but not least, we have Hulan Davadorj, who is a founder and CEO of Lamur. Um, we will hope to run this uh, uh, conversation uh, with you and probably with uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, audience, if there are any audience questions, for about an hour. Uh, with that, uh, I'll hand the floor to you, Tushin. Um, Thank you, Svante. Uh, so good morning um, to those uh, who are dialing in from the state side and good evening to everyone who are participating from Mongolia and Central Asia. Um, my name is Tufshin and I am the Mongolia country coordinator for uh, Kamka Network for this year. So uh, since many of you are dialing in from abroad, uh, we thought it would be a good idea to kick off today's discussion with a short briefing on what's going on in Mongolia. So um, of course, our participants here today are experts on economic and business matters, and they will talk soon on Mongolia's current economic state. Uh, meanwhile, I will now mainly touch upon the political as well as the foreign policy aspects of Mongolia. So first, politics. As you may know, uh, Mongolia is the only functioning democracy from the Sea of Japan to Eastern Europe. Uh, so in 2020, Mongolia had a parliamentary election and 82% of the seats, that is 82% uh, of the seats went to the ruling Mongolian People's Party, MPP. And only the 15% of the seats went to the opposition Democratic Party. And on top of that, Mongolia has a unique system um, whereby the president also balances the power of the parliament. In the last year's presidential election, also the candidate of the Mongolian People's Party won. So what does it mean? Uh, this basically means that at least up until 2024, that is in two years time, when the next parliamentary election takes place, Mongolian politics is completely, utterly dominated by the Mongolian People's Party. So because the Mongolian People's, Mongolian People's Party has the supermajority in the parliament, the expectation from the people is that 
this party will pass all the necessary and long overdue reforms. They simply have the necessary numbers. So luckily the government has attracted many young, cap capable, brilliant people such as Dulgong and Der Moon who are participating in this discussion here today and Holong in uh, unofficial capacity. And everyone is hoping that they will be able to punch through all the obstacles in the next couple of years and enact the indispensable reforms while they still have the supermajority in the parliament. So now the uh, foreign policy aspect of Mongolia. As you know, Mongolia is geographically surrounded by Russia and China, but we also do have our third neighbor policy that seeks to transcend our two immediate neighbors and have close relations with the advanced democracies around the world. So the Ukrainian issue has really put us on a tight spot. On the one hand, as a democratic country and a fellow a small country, Mongolian people are alarmed by an unprovoked invasion of a sovereign country. But on the other hand, as a country that is very much dependent on Russia to logistically access to the European market uh, and just society by an extension, Mongolia has a very limited space to maneuver on this matter. So just like India and 33 other countries, including almost all of the Kamka member countries, except for Georgia and Afghanistan, Mongolia abstained to vote on the UN resolution to condemn Russia's invasion to Ukraine. So uh, this is, you know, given all the constraints, foreign policy constraints, this is uh, probably the best we could do at the moment. But the good thing is that uh, really, you know, faithful to our uh, democratic values, there is a very robust debate going on in our society regarding what is happening in Ukraine and uh, what we could learn from this uh, uh, ongoing conflict. The sanctions on Russia are certainly affecting us very hard. Our logistical access to Europe by Russia has been shut almost overnight. And due to the COVID-19 restrictions, there's a very, very limited transportation happening between Mongolia and China. So logistically, we are in a very precarious situation at the moment. So this is almost a nightmare scenario for a landlocked country like Mongolia that has only two neighbors. And both of them have significantly curtailed our access to the rest of the world. So to sum up, Mongolia currently has to perform a very complicated tightrope dance to balance the interests of our two immediate neighbors. Uh, with our commitment to the democratic values and rules-based order. Perhaps luckily at the moment, the domestic politics is such that the ruling party has the supermajority and able to somewhat project stability and decisiveness in these trying, trying times. So uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, we will now move right on to Dulgun. Good evening and uh, good morning uh, to the friends and families as well as uh, all the uh, people attending uh, this discussion. So um, the Mongolian uh, government uh, created and uh, developed this uh, uh, new revival slash new recovery program. Uh, the intention is clear in order to uh, fasten the economic growth, and that will elevate um, thousands of people out of uh, poverty, and it will also uh, strengthen the middle class. And as we all know that um, the middle class in democracy is kind of uh, the foundation uh, to democracy. So, yeah, what, so the, now the question is, what is this new uh, recovery uh, program? And where does it come from? So uh, it's um, um, based on this growth diagnostics. And uh, the, the growth diagnostics is a methodology developed by Daniel Roderick, House, uh, Ricardo Hausman, and uh, Andrew Velasco. And those uh, three uh, Harvard professors first initiated this uh, diagnostics in order to find out where to intervene in the economy. So there are five ways to reform economy, and the best way uh, is um, 
uh, basically uh, you have to do this growth diagnostics and to start um, those uh, I start with those factors that uh, is considered binding constraint. So uh, what is binding constraint is determined when you do this growth uh, diagnostics. And uh, when we have done uh, growth diagnostics uh, on Mongolia and Mongolian economy, what we came out is number of um, issues and challenges. The first is um, a state uh, uh, capa uh, capability, and this is certainly um, reducing uh, the overall growth, and it's certainly limiting the private sector uh, uh, enterprises, um, as well as it's also affecting the quality of the services that's provided by the Mongolian government. The uh, second is about energy. Mongolia um, is uh, as between Russia and China. We have a four season. And if you want to uh, create a factory, you have to be you have to be connected with electricity, but also you have to be connected with central heating, or you have to solve the heating issue by yourself. If you independently solve a heating uh, uh, heating um, system. Uh, for your own factory, the cost will be much higher. That's why uh, it's essential for any uh, businessman or any investor to build, uh, who intend to build factory that need to be connected to the central heating system. So, but the ten, uh, central heating system itself is already operating at, at the capacity and it would be very, very difficult to uh, increase um, and add uh, the customers into the system. So that's the reason why many um, in the last 10 years, what we see is that 80% 80 80 of Mongolian in, uh, foreign direct investment that's coming into Mongolia is into mining, where it's a kind of green field. You don't have to have roads, you don't have to have um, uh, this electricity, you just do it yourself with the diesel, et cetera. And 16% of the foreign direct investment that's coming in is in um, uh, seeking markets, uh, that's the term. And that means the foreign investor wants to sell their own goods in Mongolian market. And the poor, uh, about three, uh, a little more than 3% is into searching strategic assets. That's kind of a, in um, tourism, you can, um, invest in a nice um, uh, shore next to the lake, lake, in the lake. So it's kind of a strategic location and that's uh, is uh, kind of termed the strategic asset in this uh, four types of foreign direct investment. And the most important, that's most useful to Mongolian economy is type of in, uh, foreign direct investment called efficiency seeking. And the efficiency seeking investments that happened in China since 1978 has improved Chinese economy in almost hundred, um, a few hundred times and also elevated 500 million of Chinese from poverty. But in Mongolia, efficiency seeking um, investment is almost zero uh, between um, the 2012 and 2018. So the reason is basically binding constraint. When those investors who want to build factories and uh, create jobs and export their own goods to China, because China is the uh, second biggest economy, the Mongolian, uh, Mongolian um, uh, energy sector cannot accept them or cannot connect them because it's already operating at the, uh, close to the limit. Uh, it's a, a operational limit. And same with electricity, unless we, we build electric, uh, uh, we build power plants that provide necessary uh, electricity, it will be very difficult even for Mongolians not to have blackouts. And if you start having blackouts, that's gonna reduce, um, reduce the profit and increase the uh, cost for all uh, businesses a lot. So this uh, is the second binding constraint to the Mongolian economy. And the third binding constraint is uh, determined uh, the 
we have determined is uh, cross-border and transport issues. So um, according to Asian Development Bank report, it takes about 45 minutes uh, for a train to cross from Chinese side to Kazakh side. And um, in that 45 minutes, all the uh, customs agencies go through all the necessary checks. All the spe specific inspection agencies go through necessary checks. And they change the track from a uh, wide uh, gouge to narrow gouge. And all that happens. But in Mongolia, for Mongolian um, railway, it's almost three times that uh, amount of time necessary to do exact same thing. So it's about efficiency. It's about timing to cross border to facilitate trade. So um, according to that uh, ADB report, if we, if Mongolia, uh, Mongo uh, Mongolia can reduce the, trans uh, the time that takes uh, to bring the goods from uh, to cross border by 10%, it increases uh, the GDP by basically 0.7%. So that's a huge gain, but uh, very, it's, it's considered very low hanging fruit. And it, it has been issue. Uh, it's not just came up uh, when uh, uh, it, uh, because of COVID. The COVID is just brought on the table. It, it's clear to everybody now, unless we change the system, unless we make it efficient, unless we solve the, the problem at the border, every product that's been sold in, in Mongolia and Ulaanbaatar is going to be more expensive than it supposed to be and any product that we can produce inside and then export is going to be even bigger, um, even more expensive. So it's, it's reducing our competitiveness. So those are the, at least the, the three of the six binding constraints that the government determined. And uh, we created this uh, new recovery program to improve Mongolian competitiveness and to fasten the growth so that uh, many Mongolians uh, will come out of poverty and have more opportunity in the in the medium term. So uh, I'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there's a lot we can pick up later on in that part, especially regarding the the uh, I think the power generation and electricity issues, but most importantly, I think the transport and. Uh, and the costs of landlockedness and how to overcome them. Uh, I think we can keep that in mind for our discussion. Now we go on to Irmoon for another perspective, not this time from the uh, Ministry of Econom Economy and Development, from, but from the Prime Minister's office, or perhaps just your own uh, assessment of the situation, please. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my greetings to you. I'm glad to be a part of today's uh, Kamka conversation. Um, my name is Irmo. I'm the economic policy advisor to the prime minister. And uh, Mr. Dulong touched upon the substantial part of my take as well, but um, I, I will try to uh, elaborate more on this. Well, you know, um, the time we are living in today is absolutely challenging especially from Mongolia, given the fact that as a, as a country geographically locates between two big economies and countries, that is China and Russia, our economy, especially trade is substantially depends on China, where the country that has been continually implementing zero tolerance COVID case policy, and that has significant effect on our economy and commercial activities and supply and logistics. Um, so the import heavily depends on Russia as well. Um, so 70% of our uh, Russian import is pretty much consists of uh, petrol. Um, and, and also not only in Mongolia, um, as a whole world, supply chain related problems are rising that causes tremendous uh, regress and causing butterfly effect to the world's commercial activities. So um, many of countries, including Mongolia, uh, we have achieved uh, substantial results to tackle COVID by vaccinating almost uh, 70 to 80% of our population, which gives, gives us a greater, uh, you know, um, opening and room to breathe and to focus on the recovery of our economy that has been dropped five to 6%, almost historically lowest since the early 90s. 
And we have now reduced the alertness level significantly by reopening business activities. And in, in, in result, um, in result, first and foremost, that uh, after a couple of years of lockdown, the market symptom has restored and people and business confidence and creativity has been significantly increased. Um, in addition, the actions taken by the uh, government is, is in restoring the international exposure of Mongolia's, uh, Mongolia is quite good um, by moving forward the Oitoka project, which is the, uh, with Rio Tinto, which is, which is the largest uh, copper mining project, one of the largest copper mining projects, which brought Mongolia back on track to attract foreign capital into the country. Again, um, the government of Mongolia acted fast and decided boldly to successfully overcome COVID pandemic in the country. Now that we are facing with challenges um, such as how to swiftly and smoothly manage our economy in most effective and efficient manner. Therefore, we have been working hard to introduce effective policy tools and instruments, including this uh, new uh, revival policy which the wrong covered uh, almost every, every, uh, every part of it. So currently the government is entirely focused on the uh, new re revival policy. The chief principle philosophy behind the term called the new is because we can't return to the normal that we used to know and we got used to because the normal uh, we knew was precisely the problem. Yeah, so therefore we are uh, introducing this policy. The new recovery policy aims to strengthen Mongolia's uh, economic independence and reduce negative impact of the uh, uh, coronavirus infection pandemic on the economy and promptly address the development barriers. So that this policy is actually the medium term target program uh, for up to uh, 10 years intended uh, for creating the basic conditions for uh, effective realization of Mongolia's learned and development policy and improving the economy and infrastructure and public productivity. You see, the, uh, to be honest with you, so far, Mongolia has produced over 500 development policies and strategies over the past 30 years. Uh, some of them achieved and some of them not. The core competence of this program, the main idea is that we have uh, to see things differently this time, because these 500, the aforementioned 500 uh, something doc development documents are mostly wish list and slogan sort of programs. But this time, this policy is different because for the first time almost, we have defined our problems realistically. We have identified major constraints that causes regressive bottlenecks of our development. Finally, we are not talking about the elephant in the room. So um, we hope um, to achieve with this realiza realization of this new recovery policy, the economic growth uh, we uh, forecast uh, to, will be maintained at an average of uh, six percent in the long term, and uh, per capita for national income will double, and the labor force participation rate will reach sixty-five percent. Um, the border ports capacity will increase uh, threefold, and the energy sources will increase twofold. The basic conditions will be created uh, uh, to reach the goals of objectives of this phase of Vision 2050, the long-term development policy of Governor Mongolia. So, um, Dulcon covered uh, the six constraints analysis. I mean, uh, diagnosis. So, first one is the recovery of operation of border ports, and uh, to energy recovery. Uh, industrial recovery, third one, and the fourth one is the urban and rural recovery, and recovery through green development and recovery of the public productivity. So these are the main six uh, constraints factors that causes the uh, regress of our development. So yeah. Um, um, last but not least, the general principle of our economy, in my opinion, I've tried to <laughs> um, um, determine is that the uh, our economy has this three, I mean, three basic, uh, three basic economies, brown economy, green economy, and digital economy. This, this, this is the, uh, the, the, the roof of our economy that will be endorsed by the pillars like household economy, business economy, and foreign sectors economy. And these are the uh, targets that we are looking at. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have now heard uh, a couple of perspectives that talk about the, should we call it the macro level, uh, how things are, what the government is trying to do, the, uh, should we call it a strategic situation. 
Uh, but I am now looking forward to hearing from an entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur in, 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 from Mongolia who is actively trying to uh, overcome some of the challenges we have spoken about. Uh, and I think it'll be interesting to hear what do you make of this from the side of an entrepreneur who has to deal with this, so to speak, in real life, in uh, uh, day to day. Uh, and what are the challenges you're facing? Do you recognize? Uh, do you agree? Is this a picture you would paint? Is your perspective perhaps slightly different? And what do you think are the ways uh, forward from this situation? Please, Hulan, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Swante. Um, hello, everybody. So this is Hulan. Um, I am an entrepreneur. Um, um, I have been an entrepreneur for quite some time trying to um, create a Mongolian um, brand that is recognized internationally. So we um, are a manufacturer of natural skincare products. Uh, we were the first organic skincare brand from Mongolia. And, and because we are trying to go international, um, obviously the pandemic has um, had a toll on us because we um, used to, in 2019, um, export to nine countries. Um, and because of the pandemic, a lot of our distributors um, have been facing um, hard times. And because the borders were closed, we had a lot of issues with the transportation, um, etc. cetera. But um, um, on the other hand, throughout the pandemic, um, we did see slight advantages when it came um, to local actually sales, because once the borders were closed um, and we had a shortage of a lot of products that we um, were importing, actually, we saw that a lot of our customers were turning to us when it came to um, products. So for example, our um, business for example, sales increase because a lot of, for example, um, you know, businesses used to import liquid soap, um, etc. And then once they could not import that anymore, or they had difficulties with the increased prices, or they um, the products were stuck at the borders, they started uh, turning to us, which was indeed an advantage for us. Um, Post pandemic, um, locally. Um, we're doing fine. I do believe that this time there are a lot of um, efficient policies um, in the making, but obviously policies take a long term. So um, currently we are facing a lot of issues because once the pandemic was easing out in Mongolia and we were, um, you know, going back to normal, we had this whole thing um, with the war happening. So now we see, for example, with us um, difficulties with transactions, um, we see also difficulties with logistics, um, etc. But because we do not export to Europe um, and we export actually more to Asia and we focus on the States currently, um, it's it's a bit um, better for us. Um, before the pandemic, um, for the private sector, we did have um, a lot of uh, challenges already with the transportation and um, the, the payment system, for example, uh, with the transactions, and now it's becoming even more tougher. So um, as an entrepreneur, obviously, uh, I am trying to look for ways uh, to solve these issues um, by, for example, um, creating a company in the US which enabled us to um, have our warehouse uh, launch, for example, on Amazon, launch uh, on various kind of online um, stores, etc. So we are trying to maneuver um, everything that we do, especially when it comes to international um, transactions, international um, you know, everything we do internationally, literally. But um, on the other hand, as I mentioned, with the pandemic, we, as a local producer, did see um, increase of sales within our um, Mongolian, um, like with our Mongolian customers, which showed them how important it is to actually uh, manufacture locally and, you know, made in Mongolia, how valuable that is. So I think the pandemic obviously was creating a lot of challenges for everybody, but especially for businesses, it gave us, um, you know, an opportunity to step back, to really focus on our values and um, on our roots and, and to really focus on our business model. 
and it also gave um, especially the Mongolians a really good understanding about local products, um, local manufacturing and how actually valuable it is to the economy as well. So we did see um, both sides to the end. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, at this point, we have, um, the, I would like to uh, urge our audience to raise questions and comments, and I think our speakers would be happy to react to them. Um, while our audience ponders uh, their, um, their interventions, as it would be called, um, I have a couple of thoughts on my own. I think a few of the things um, that come up from your presentation link, of course, to some uh, processes that are happening globally. And one of these, especially I was struck by Hulan's presentation uh, in which, which relates to the, you know, should we call it the reversal of globalization in a certain sense that we see both with the pandemic and with the sanctions regimes, um, especially between the West and Russia. Uh, now, Mongolia, of course, is landlocked. Mongolia um, has, uh, in a way, been increasingly dependent on market relations with its um, big neighbors, not least for transit. Um, some industries may be able to turn towards a domestic market, um, but especially I, I suspect that being a neighbor of China, the, uh, there are difficulties in that. You may have an, an economy that's more open than the Chinese one, which means I suppose that the uh, Chinese products will come in is it possible for you to compete with the Chinese products? Uh, I mean, in, in a certain type of industry, it may be, in other industries, it might be very difficult. What are the options for Mongolia, if, if you will, in, in, a, in, in a world where people are really looking, re revisiting some of the uh, things we took for granted only a few years ago about, about you know, free trade, globalization, and so on. Uh, now that we're seeing that uh, in a lot of places in the world, things are going in a different direction, either by will or by necessity. Is there anybody who would like to take a stab at that question? Dulgun, are you, you look like you have some thoughts, no? <laughs> it's, um, yeah. Uh, it's hard to say at this early stage um, the total impact of uh, COVID. And also um, what's happening in Ukraine is has uh, quite a bit of uh, impact on us. Um, um, the COVID, like, let's talk about trade. So what happened is that, um, as Ilmun uh, said, um, China has zero COVID strategy and Mongolia has endemic COVID strategy. We are living with uh, COVID. And, because of that uh, difference in strategies, there is a uh, more um, a cost on the trade and not just the, um, in terms of time, in terms of volume, it's also increasing, um, it's a much lower volume, both for import and export. So what we had seen in the uh, last year um, or so is that shift in trade. Basically those uh, producers, uh, they get intermediate goods from um, China and they produce here uh, for the final goods. They reroute it and they, uh, some of them are from Turkey and some of them from Europe, some of them from Russia. So there has been a shifting in trade. But now there is a Ukraine issue and it's, uh, the, uh, the transit transport has been affected. Um, it's, it's, it's for sure. And we don't know how long it's going to be. And that means there is also um, quite a bit of um, difficulty uh, for intermediate goods, uh, not just final goods, to come uh, to Mongolia. So that has been, uh, that requires a bit of thinking and that requires challenge. And if uh, before uh, COVID pandemic, we know that uh, there is a trade, there has been a trade war between China and America. And that ha has also affected us indirectly through a uh, higher cost and um, a lengthy, uh, lengthy time uh, for transport. Uh, so our, uh, our strategy um, would be rather than, um, um, rather than accessing markets that uh, it's been beyond our uh, reach 
even before uh, COVID, it's going to be e even more uh, unreachable for us. So we might just focus on um, those markets, not just markets, but also um, when we say markets, we think of countries, but for size of Mongolia, we just th can think of uh, um, provinces of China, for example, or provinces of Japan or provinces of Korea. If we supply certain specific goods that's within our capability to produce, that would be more advantageous as long as we uh, produce that goods, not just goods, but also services with a competitive cost. Thank you. If I turn to Hulan, you talked about how you were able to, so to speak, uh, have uh, domestic demand temporarily make up for some of the troubles. Do you view this as a long-term uh, shift or just a short-term reaction in a specific crisis and then you're going to go back to your original strategy or has this changed your long-term approach? Um, well, as a business, we have to be quite uh, quick um, with everything we do, um, pandemic or not. So uh, we did actually um, take it as a long term strategy to not just only focus on retail, um, but also focus on business to business. So actually, we bought our very first uh, equipment just a month ago, and we are now, um, you know, trying to um, not just uh, create handmade products in small batches, but also really use our advantages of having all, um, you know, all these amazing raw materials that we have in Mongolia, all these, um, you know, organic, wild, natural uh, raw materials that we as a natural skincare manufacturer can utilize, but also um, trying, as you mentioned, obviously not every sector can, um, you know, compete with China currently, but I do believe that um, especially for businesses in Mongolia, we can um, utilize especially this um, advantage that we have, which is, you know, all these amazing organic um, raw materials. So we are um, trying not, not to compete with the Chinese products, but to really create our own values, um, create our own um, advantages and work together with the businesses so that they can have, um, you know, feasible priced um, products that are good for their um, businesses. So that's why we did in fact really shift our business model and um, are thinking of long-term, um, you know, um, supplying businesses such as hotels, resorts, mm -hmm. um, restaurants. We are uh, just starting to also supply um, medical centers, etc. And we, be we do believe that this is a long-term thing for us and for our country as well. Thank you. Now, um, the uh, going a little bit beyond the, the pandemic issue, obviously transport connections to Europe have become complicated uh, by the uh, by the Russian uh, war and the uh, sanctions that resulted from it. So I'm wondering if this has led Mongolia in some way to focus more of its energies on the connections across uh, Central Asia and the Caspian to reach Europe through that way. Or is that something that uh, is not um, changing very much compared to the trade patterns that existed before? Uh, I don't know. Who would like to take a stab at that? Tuvshin, perhaps, or Irmun? Um, sure. I am not uh, a transportation expert, and uh, probably Irmun can add on what I would say. Um, so. Basically, when it comes to the land uh, access, you know, no matter where we have more access via uh, Central Asia or Caucasus, we, we still have to, you know, go through Russia and China. Um, however, um, recently there have been news of resuming of flights to Kazakhstan as well as to Kyrgyzstan. Uh, I'm not quite sure how often they are flying, but uh, that's still a good news, you know, and we're hoping that uh, those kind of accesses will be able to give us more, um, you know, uh, chances to access to the rest of the world. Um, so that being said, again, you know, uh, we're hoping that the whole thing will 
uh, somewhat reach, uh, you know, uh, you know, a peaceful conclusion, uh, hopefully soon. But again, up until then, we are in a very tight spot. Yeah. Well, Moon, I think you have to be prepared yeah. for these, uh, this situation to last for quite a long time, I'm afraid, but your moon. <laughs> Again, I'd like to take you back to the subject of uh, recovery policy regarding mm -hmm. the border parts and the connectivity issues. The hard and soft infrastructure of the borders parts uh, of the ports shall be uh, the general ideas of further developed and their freight and passenger capacity and exports shall be increased. That's the aim, right? And the, um, what we are planning, what we are trying to achieve uh, planning is that the border ports will be uh, fully connected by railway and paved roads and their freight and uh, logistics competitiveness will be uh, improved significantly and uh, traffic will be enhanced. Obviously the basic conditions from uh, for turning them into a transit hub will be created. So uh, this is the idea. Um, but one of the uh, also additional ideas, in my opinion, personally that I have is that um, perhaps it is time for international community, the trade ministers, trade agencies to talk about the, uh, the, the supply chain uh, disruption issues. So even by creating this, um, you know, creating this uh, global supply chain disruption, global supply chain uh, networking platform as a dialogue between the countries. It is important, uh, uh, you know, mechanism for right now these days. Thank you. Um... There's a question from the audience, which is related to, oh, Dulgun, please, if you want yeah, to, uh, talk, please. Yeah, I'd like to add on top of what Irmoon and Dushinle said, the land route uh, there is, uh, through truck and railway, and therefore railway, there are three, um, three ways to, uh, to come to Mongolia through Russia. One is through Belarus. Brest is the main, uh, main terminal uh, of rock right? and to, through Ukraine and the, through Latvia. So um, because of the issues uh, that has happening, uh, two of those uh, uh, railway um, channels is kind of uh, reduced uh, uh, significantly. And for goods to, uh, to arrive safely, um, it has to, uh, three agents uh, has to confirm. First is exporter himself, if he, thinks that if his goods going to be uh, damaged uh, en route, then uh, the exporter can just shut, shut it down and just say, say wait uh, until uh, things settle down. Uh, I'll, I'll keep the goods and uh, send it when, when uh, things uh, settle down. And the second is the insurer. If the insurer disagrees and uh, not many things can move, and that's the case of Mongolian Airlines. We are no longer uh, flying over Russia because of uh, insurance issues. Um, and the third is transporter. If the uh, logistics companies are refused to um, or not no longer operating because of, for example, um, uh, signaling issues in the uh, Belarusian uh, railways uh, that has been significantly uh, reduced uh, military and non-military uh, price. And the third is actually most people pay attention, which is uh, the countries themselves uh, uh, can uh, make uh, do the sanctions so that it, even uh, those goods that goes through uh, Russia in transit can be uh, in sanctions, so it cannot arrive. And those are the uh, major uh, issues to think. And if uh, those goods are not uh, being able to transport through Russia, then we, uh, we had looked at how many, uh, what amount of uh, volume we are talking about at the ministry. And we have looked already at those and we can divide those goods into categories. For example, things uh, no longer can be transit through Russia. Then what about air, uh, air transport directly from Germany or Turkey, uh, right? And certain amounts, certain percentage of goods can do so uh, because it's small amount, high price. So it, it, they are uh, still, uh, we Mongolians can still import those uh, goods like uh, pharmaceutical uh, item. Uh, we can still import it whether uh, the transit route is uh, closed or not. 
Thank you. Um, the question from the audience was about foreign direct investment and whether Mongolia has a preference in where that FDI comes from. I suppose either of the two, the Prime Minister's office or the Ministry of Economy could be the right target for that question. Well, well as a generic uh, terms that, we, in, I mean, uh, attracting in, investment, foreign investment, foreign capital, is absolutely policy competition among countries. So therefore, um, uh, Mongolia's uh, effort to attract foreign capital and investment is, uh, uh, is, is, is very essential uh, uh, factors to our economy. Um, so um, the, um, we have reestablished our, our uh, investment promotion agency. So and this agency has now the functionality of trade as well. So um, the, uh, uh, this time we will focus on to uh, push forward, move forward our uh, mega projects. And also uh, by mega projects means that for the, for, I mean, just to be honest with you, for the last 30 years, my, we, when we tried to go on and knock the doors and attracting investment, the major problem was that, that, that the, the lack of bankable projects, bankable feasibility study projects. So now this will be different this time because now we're creating, I mean, we are uh, submitting, submitting the uh, amendment of uh, public private partnership law. And um, with that law, we will create this, uh, uh, we, we, we think to create this uh, public private partnership center and the project development facility entirely focus on to, uh, to, uh, to work on our uh, uh, um, feasibility studies of our mega projects. So this will give us more, uh, you know, chance to go out and knock the door and show the uh, good bankable feasibility projects uh, to, to our international investment community. Thank you. Uh, we have just a couple of minutes. Um, I thought to ask you all what you think Mongolia's friends and partners uh, in America and in Europe, what is it you think they could do in order to facilitate this process of uh, overcoming these challenges that we have, uh, that we've discussed now for close to an hour? Anybody? I love more products. That's a good one. <laughs> That's a good one. Yes, and I think we can do that. So yes. that's also a re re is there an export promotion uh, facility in Mongolia that is present in Western markets and in Asian markets? Now there are other things that we can do. Um, Please do. Okay. Um, uh, Mongolia promotes through uh, its own. Um, um, embassies and uh, consuls, but I'm, I'm not uh, expert in those area. But uh, what I do is that uh, to strengthen democracy uh, here in Mongolia, we need to grow the economy rapidly. And through our um, high growth, we will strengthen, we make sure that the uh, livelihoods of the people are improved. So that will strengthen the trust in democratic, uh, democratic system and the trust in institutions. And without uh, capable institutions, it will be very difficult in the medium to long run uh, to keep uh, improving the quality of democracy and, uh, and the livelihood of uh, not just democracy, but also livelihood uh, is, uh, is at stake. So, uh, the most important thing that uh, foreign foreigners, can, uh, foreign countries can do is so uh, um, do business with us, uh, work together, uh, invest here in Mongolia. Let's uh, build uh, products uh, so that we let's make the products here together and we export to uh, near market. We have the second biggest economy next to our door. And I know uh, our other neighbor is, uh, uh, neighbor is in uh, trouble. Uh, but it's not going to uh, remain so uh, for a long time. So uh, it's also um, we're thinking of uh, improving those uh, dem uh, democracy levels in our 
uh, our, uh, our neighbors. And so if that's the issue, um, then uh, we can be uh, we can be the role model for uh, nations around us. And it's our will, it's our um, our own desire to keep this uh, uh, system in place. It's not just uh, we we have this system installed upon us. It's our will and it's our nature, and we respect and uh, value our freedom um, as well. And so through foreign direct investment, we will strengthen our economy. And uh, through foreign investment, we will make sure our, our uh, citizens can build valuable products so that they, they uh, improve their uh, livelihoods all, uh, through their own, uh, own hand. And that's very important for, for us. So uh, one last thing uh, to say is that um, our prime minister created this um, vision 2050, and we have six priority sectors agriculture, uh, information technology, and those are, uh, in my opinion, uh, the most uh, potential uh, sectors for investors to come. We will not uh, distinguish our investors where they're from. They can be from Africa, they can, from, uh, can be from America or even China. We will work to improve uh, uh, together uh, the, both the business environment as well as uh, the businesses itself. So the Mongolian government is open. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perhaps Any last I words, Tushin? Yeah, perhaps I could say, uh, you know, to answer your question from more foreign policy perspective. Um, so uh, from our friends in the West, uh, uh, friends and partners in the West, uh, we want more engagement, um, not just, you know, day-to-day uh, -day projects and everything, but more uh, major initiatives and uh, you know uh, creative, uh, innovative um, you know partnerships. So uh, up until uh, very recently, uh, Mongolia's uh, relations with the West was very much dependent on uh, democracy, uh, which is not necessarily uh, really high on the agenda these days uh, for many countries. Um, and also uh, our, uh, the fact that we uh, contributed troops to Afghanistan's, Afghanistan in NATO's mission was a major leverage for us uh, to uh, cooperate with, uh, the West, with our Western friends and partners. However, with, uh, during the, uh, because of the last summer's US withdrawal uh, and NATO withdrawal from Afghanistan, we certainly lost that pillar. And when everyone is quite busy uh, with, the, uh, with Ukraine and China, um, you know, democracy for us, promotion has uh, not necessarily gotten enough attention and support. So again, this is a, we've now entered a period where Mongolia's relations with the West is uh, not necessarily the most active. Um, although, you know, it's just winging, uh, it, it's certainly, doing the minimum necessary. Uh, however, we need more breakthroughs. We need more, uh, you know, major initiatives just to, you know, um, keep the whole impetus going. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid we're out of time, uh, but I think this has been a very useful uh, overview of the Mongolian economic situation and response. And uh, I suppose we will be able to come back to this if not before, at the Kamka Forum this summer, which I think will focus very much on these type of issues. And we will be able to compare how Mongolia is responding to some of your neighbors in Central Asia, as well as the Caucasus. And we look forward to seeing you in another Kamka conversation, as well as in Khaki Forums coming up very soon. Until then, uh, thank you all for taking part and good night to those of you in Mongolia and a good day to those in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye.